It's my great pleasure to see you all uh, in here for, uh, for participation in our tutorial. And it is an honor of, uh, to greet professionals from all over country and uh, the abroad who share the same aim uh, in helping for our patients and are ready to work out the best texts of diagnosis and treatment of uh, patients who need in our professional help. So I view your presence here. И uh, мы будем uh, продолжать, коллеги, и uh, так случилось неожиданно по абсолютно объективным причинам президент uh, Европейской гематологической ассоциации не может присутствовать, и он сделал видеозапись приветствия нашего события. Пожалуйста. Good morning, my name is Peter Sonnefeld and I am the president of the European Hematology Association, EHA. It is my honor to welcome you at this tutorial, the fourth EHA, uh, Russian Oncology Hematology Society and uh, the National Hematology Society. Uh, this tutorial on real world challenges and opportunities in the diagnosis and the management of patients with hemato-oncology diseases. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you today because of um, family circumstances. But I would like to take the opportunity to welcome you all in Moscow again. And I really uh, like that you are all here. We at EHA are happy uh, with the warm and very pleasant collaboration with the Russian colleagues uh, and both societies that has resulted in this educational meeting. The fact that the tutorial is organized in collaboration with the two Russian societies is extremely important also for EHA because together we can achieve more. The program you will follow today and tomorrow will focus on a broad range of onco-hematological malignancies and will cover the diagnosis and management of patients with these diseases uh, in all stages of the disease. You will listen to lectures from many distinguished speakers from Spain, Italy, France, and of course, Russia. Through clinical cases and self-assessments, um, you will learn in the optimal way how to um, uh, address the various topics in the program. So please enjoy the program and we wish you a very pleasant meeting and a very fruitful uh, discussion. Thank you. Таким образом, после приветствия президента Европейской ассоциации гематологии Питера Зонарфельда мы можем с вами продолжить. И я хотела бы от двух наших обществ, от общества российского онкогематологов и от национального гематологического общества, которое возглавляет Валерий Григорьевич и Елена Николаевна здесь с нами как основной представитель, и от Европейской ассоциации рассказать о том, что произошло, как мы сотрудничаем, где наши точки соприкосновения, насколько эффективно, активно это происходит. Ну, надо сказать, что мы действительно очень, наши гематологические сообщества очень тесно взаимодействуют с э, профессиональными сообществами других стран. Мы хорошо и давно сотрудничаем с Европейским гематологической ассоциацией, э, с Американским обществом клинической онкологии, с Гериатрическим обществом международным, с Европейским обществом про трансплантацию клеток крови и костного мозга. И особо я хочу выделить Организационный комитет Международной конференции злокачественной лимфомы, потому что из трех лидеров этого общества, конечно, особая так сказать, ценность для нас в виде контактов представляет профессор Франко Кавали. Он был идейным вдохновителем нашей конференции злокачественной лимфоны, лимфомы. Он многие годы сопредседательствовал и до сих пор так сказать, проявляет интерес к российской гематологии очень большой.
А с Европейской гематологической ассоциацией мы вместе уже 7 лет. Это срок, который, безусловно, значим. А если отметить так сказать, какие-то вехи нашей совместной деятельности и успехи отечественного гематологического сообщества, то хочется сказать, как выступал Евгений Александрович Никитин на конференции Европейской гематологической ассоциации в 2013 году. Причем он выступал с результатами, почему это было ему предложено, с результатами московского протокола по лечению больных хроническим лимфолейкозом, разработанный Вадимом Вадимовичем Птушкиным и им. И это имело определенный интересный научный резонанс. В 2014 году в Милане был организован уже совместный симпозиум наших двух российских обществ и Европейской гематологической ассоциации, где Елена Николаевна и я выступали с сообщениями, подводя итоги, опять-таки, результаты работы наших отечественных гематологов. Ну и с 2013 года мне хочется показать, такой, знаете, большой э, галерею, большую портретов, где на, на конференции злокачественных лимфомах выступили вот здесь их 26 человек, наших э, коллег, лидеров в э, мировой гематологии, и это для нас очень значимо, поэтому, безусловно, вот это сотрудничество с Европейской гематологической ассоциацией действительно имеет очень интересные плоды. И сегодня мы с вами на очередном форуме, хотя начиналось это еще в 2013 году, и в Санкт-Петербурге, и в Москве было два туториала совместных, это проводило Национальное гематологическое общество, вот Елена Николаевна, Николаевна с Валерий, Валерий Григорьевичем, оно было посвящено проблемам острова лейкозы и, и трансплантации костного мозга. Э, в 2016 году мы обсуждали э, ведение больных тактику при осложнениях, э, при нежелательных явлениях современных лечебных подходов. А сегодня мы с вами поставили перед собой задачи, которая звучит как реальные вызовы и перспективы диагностики и лечения онкогематологических пациентов. Причем мы обозначили так сказать, ос, те нозологии, для которых это имеет максимальную актуальность, и решили остановиться на вопросах иммуногематологии, ибо на сегодня это тот раздел, который, во-первых, очень стремительно развивается, во-вторых, очень интересен э, с научной фундаментальной точки зрения использования, и, в-третьих, крайне желательно для того, чтобы он использовался в нашей с вами практике. Значит, любая организация, подобная, проводимая нашими сообществами, дает возможность вам, э, нашим отечественным коллегам, получить соответствующие кредиты э, или баллы по э, программе непрерывного медицинского э, образования. Здесь будет 11 кредитов. Вы их сможете получить, это свидетельство, э, завтра. Напом напомню, что получить и, и ценность это будет иметь только в том случае, если у вас есть свой личный кабинет на портале НМО, и тогда это автоматически попадет э, в вашу ячейку для набора общего количества баллов. Хочу опять напомнить всем, что все материалы форума будут выложены на сайтах наших обществ и на мультидисциплинарном в сайте Медфоше, поэтому вы будете иметь возможность, как после любой нашей вот такой активности, посмотреть раз, два, столько раз, сколько захочется, вернуться к презентациям, услышать голос спикера и решить для себя поставленные какие-то э, проблемы. Но вот для того, чтобы все было хорошо, я надеюсь, что как бы левая часть понятна абсолютно, э, а э, активность ваша в виде э, возможной дискуссии, в виде за, э, возникновения вопросов, очень приветствуется для того, чтобы мы действительно имели возможность обсудить те проблемы, которые сегодня будут поставлены. И, конечно, хочется поблагодарить за поддержку наших спонсоров. У нас генеральным спонсором является компания «Тагеда». У нас три, четыре золотых спонсора – «Эбви», «Эстрозенека», «Янсен» и «Рош». У нас серебряными спонсорами являются «Биокат» и «Бристоль Майерс Сквип». И «Сотекс» является информационным партнером. 
Я не могу не сказать, что сегодня у нас в России праздник. Это праздник, который мы чтим и помним этот день очень хорошо, ибо действительно это момент начала освоения космоса. Гагарин в полете, он говорил, поехали. Им теперь всегда говорят о том, что легкого взлета и мягкой посадки... Ну вот, Ну вот, действительно, мы можем начинать. И я с удовольствием хочу предоставить слово э, Карин Смарт. Она является исполнительным директором Европейской ассоциации э, гематологии. Э, мы с ней работаем вот, так сказать, в тесном контакте на протяжении всех этих лет. Э, человек очень надежный, очень инициативный, креативный. Э, у нее есть несколько слов. Пожалуйста. Пожалуйста, Карин. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Irina and Professor Elena, if I may call you like that. Uh, a warm welcome to you. Um, Professor Sonnefeld, EHA president, was supposed to stand here, but he just explained in the opening video that he unfortunately can't be here for personal reasons. So I'm stepping in. The only issue is that I'm not a hematologist, so I can't tell you uh, that much about the profession, you know much more than I do, but fortunately, uh, I think we have excellent faculty available, and I really uh, encourage, same as uh, Professor uh, Irina did, to ask questions, and uh, uh, not any question is wrong, or... So please feel free to ask questions. Um, a little bit about the European Hematology Association. And I think I know how this works. Yes. Um, in this slide, um, our core activities are captured. And I'm not going to take you through a long presentation to explain them all. Um, but the core messages we try to capture in what we are doing is we try to connect worldwide. Uh, we advocate for the interest of hematologists and hematology. We support career development uh, and research, and we uh, try to contribute to the harmonization of education. And going through all these core messages, there's one important issue we always take into account, and that is that international collaboration is key. Together, we can make really make a difference. So that's why we also uh, incorporate that collaboration in our uh, activities. So here you see a little bit um, more specified what we are doing, and again, I'm not going to address them all. However, I would like to focus on two of our activities, the annual congress and the EHA campus. The annual congress is um, approaching its 25th edition next year, and this year we are going to have the 24th edition in Amsterdam. And the EHA campus is our youngest baby, just launched at uh, the beginning of this year in January. Um, so a little bit more about our annual congress. Uh, I think that's an example of international collaboration because there we see many hematologists from all over the world connecting, uh, sharing knowledge, um, listening to the latest insights in research, etc. So altogether, um, we are expecting over 11,000 hematologists in June in Amsterdam, and I hope that we are also able to welcome many of you from Russia. Um, we still, however, it's a large audience, we still manage to keep to a rather, um, let's say, not small program, but a program that is manageable for delegates. So it offers a lot of variation in terms of session formats, but there's also not an overkill that you have to choose between 25 or uh, 35 sessions at the same time slot. So you get a pretty good overview of what's going on. The important dates, um, 
May 10, the early registration uh, deadline is there. So if you're planning to attend, please do, because then you can, uh, be, please do before May 10, because then you can still benefit from the early registration fee. Um, a very important other, other deadline is also the late breaking abstract submission from May 13 to 16. So if there's anything interesting in the pipeline, we encourage you to submit a late breaking abstract. If we look at the attendance of um, Russian colleagues uh, at our congresses, um, last year there were 191 delegates from Russia, uh, and we see uh, a little bit of a decrease. So we hope to see an increase in Amsterdam next year. But the good news is also that we see an increase in the number of submitted abstracts. Um, and submitting an abstract goes usually uh, together with having access to a congress, so we encourage you very much again to submit abstracts. 139 abstracts last year, so let's hope for uh, a little bit more. We are still counting and allocating for the 24th congress, so let's hope for a little bit more. But we hope to welcome you all there. The education program, a couple of slides about the education program and the new online learning platform. On this slide, you see uh, the background of the education program, what it should do. Um, it equips hematologists with knowledge at par with European standards through online and live learning. It encourages professional development. And there's also now, since uh, three years in a row, uh, a European exam added to the program. So it's a combination of live meetings, online learning, but also there is a certification attached. Um, on January 1st, we uh, launched the EHA campus, which is part of the overall education program of EHA. It's a new platform. Maybe you already had a, a look at it. Um, it is really a learning platform. So it's not reading, you really need to do something. And that means um, browse through pictures and indicate on, uh, for example, morphology pictures, what you think you see there, answer questions in EHA courses, um, etc. So for the moment, it consists uh, of e-courses, clinical cases, and uh, also a new one, statistics for clinical research. There is a morphology on call, um, and there are master classes. So it's really a learning tool and, uh, and not reading. If you are an EHA member, you have uh, uh, free access to this platform. If you are below 36, it's only 20 euros. Uh, but if you want to have a sneak preview, please do. But at the end of this month, we are going to uh, uh, make the campus uh, accessible for only EHA members. But until now, until the end of the month, it's open to everybody. So the membership benefits are listed here, but you can also find them on the website. Um, and I would like to also say a few words, of course, last but not least, about the important collaboration. And I think uh, there's a key player sitting in front of me who played a key role in establishing many contacts uh, in international collaborations, Professor Robin Foa from Italy. Um, so he was, uh, he was basically uh, the main driving force behind our international collaboration program. Um, and there's one key starting point for each collaboration, and that is that we add value. And that means that we always team up with national societies or other partners, and then we go together in a country, in a region. And EHA usually doesn't go on its own. It's always in collaboration. So that also happened here. Um, there were hematology tutorials in 2013 and 2016. And uh, this one is uh, the third one. Uh, joint sessions at annual congresses. Uh, and there is going to be a new joint activity. And that is the one-day expert exchanges, where we are going to exchange key um, um, yeah, key speakers, key experts to provide knowledge in a certain, um, I think, hospital. 
yeah, that's what we are aiming at. But the details will uh, follow soon. Um, so it's nice to see that it's expanding. And again, together uh, you go faster. So that's, uh, I think, a very good example. Then I would like to say almost thank you, spasiba, if I pronounce it right. I just asked uh, the Russian colleagues if I did that in a correct way, so I hope you understand what I'm saying. But anyway, thank you. But before um, uh, ending this presentation, I would like to do a very practical exercise game with you, which is how these voting boxes work. And for that, we are going to... Uh, go through uh, a couple of slides where you can test how it works. So here you see the basic principles. When the question is on the screen, the, the voting is open and you can give your answer on the voting box. Um, when you hear the countdown music, you have 10 seconds to answer. You can change in these 10 seconds 10 times, uh, as many times if you want. But after the voting is closed, you of course can't change anymore. Um, the questions are multiple choice, so press the number or letter corresponding to the answer. So you see on the voting box it's one or A, it's two or B. That corresponds with the questions on the screen you see. And make sure that when you give an answer that the light on your voting box lights up green, because then it connects to the system. Uh, the voting is anonymous. We are not going to present individual results. We also don't know that because we don't know who has which voting box. So feel free to make uh, any mistakes. Uh, um, don't worry about that. Um, in addition, uh, we are going to show you the results of the group so that can facilitate the discussion. So now we are going to do a few test questions. Practice question. What is your gender? Okay. So 81% female and 90% male. Well, that's what we see in many countries. Uh, hematology, but... Uh, medical practice in general is really a feminine uh, profession. So which country is the most beautiful? Russia, the Netherlands, Italy, France, Spain? Yeah. Again, feel free. <laughs> Ta-ta. Of course, 70%. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so these were the test questions. Now you know how it works. Um, so please use them. And for the rest, it's an informal meeting. Ask any questions you want. Also the team of uh, EHA and also uh, of your two societies are here. If we can help you with anything, just uh, ask us a question. And for the rest, I hope you have a lovely and very productive meeting uh, and a good time. And thank you for having us. So, dear friends, dear colleagues, I would like to continue our first scientific session. And it's a pleasure to say that we are all together cooperating and making history, the history of our knowledge in hematology. And uh, it's a pleasure again to invite our guest, Professor Alvara Urbana Espoeya from Spain, Barcelona. He is a director of Oncology Hematology Clinic. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, tutorial and let me to congratulate all of you for the celebration of the Cosmonaut uh, Day. So I think that they were a hero so, and they were a model for, for all of us. So uh, uh, the, 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 the title of my talk is, for, is CAR T cells from the concept uh, to the clinic. So you know that the immune system defends our body against uh, diseases and the T cells are key soldiers 
uh, targeting infected or abnormal cells, but uh, cancer cells uh, can block cancer cells can block uh, those defenses. So we are currently uh, uh, engineering T cells to make them smarter, tougher for seeking out and destroying uh, cancer cell. And one of the versions of this uh, T cell engineered uh, 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 immune system is CAR T cells. So uh, I would like to uh, to talk about this uh, the, the CAR T cells from the concept to the to the clinic in a, uh, in a presentation that I have divided in four parts. First is the structure and mechanism of action of CAR, so the concept of CAR. Second is how to prepare a CAR in an uh, academic uh, setting in a hospital. So I, and I will present our own experience in the Hospital Clinico Barcelona. Third is the main results of uh, the use of CAR in hematological malignancies. And finally, just two comments, one about the, the, the most important complication after CAR administration, the cytokine release syndrome, and what are the trends of CARs uh, currently. So first is the concept of CAR. And uh, to understand the, 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 the role of, of, of a CAR, uh, uh, we must know the, how T cells are activated. So for full activation of a T cell, there are two signals that are necessary. The first signal, uh, the first signal is just the identification of a peptide of an antigen uh, uh, presented by antigen presenting cell with the T cell receptor. This is the, the stimulating uh, signal, the first signal. But a second signal is, is necessary. It's called the co-stimulatory uh, uh, signal and is uh, driven by uh, pairs of molecules, uh, the co-stimulatory molecules, in this case, the CD28 and, and CD80. So with these two signals, T cells are fully activated, uh, they may proliferate, and they are very highly uh, cytotoxic. So the problem is that in most of the tumor uh, uh, cells do not express co-stimulatory molecule. So T cells identify the antigen in the tumor cells, but these T cells are not fully activated because they don't find the co-stimulatory molecule on the surface of the tumor cell. So this is the most important part of the chimeric antigen receptor that they contain the co-stimulatory molecule, as you may see in the slide. So uh, this is a chimeric antigen receptor. It's a protein. Uh, there is an extracellular domain of the protein. Uh, that are, uh, these extracellular domain are uh, single uh, chain variable fragments of the binding region of a monoclonal antibody. A uh, intracellular domain, the T cell receptor, so you may see how uh, is a chimeric receptor because this receptor has a part which is humoral, so it's, a, it's based on a monoclonal antibody, and the other part is based on T cell receptor, so it's a cellular immune mediated. So humoral and cellular mediated is that is the reason why it's called chimeric. But this Chimeric antigen receptor also contains in the intracellular domain a co-stimulatory molecule, either 41BB or CD28. So just identifying the antigen, this chimeric antigen receptor will send the signal of full activation to the T cell. Uh, this is the explanation why with the first generation cars that were called uh, T bodies, uh, the, clinical, uh, the, the clinical practice was a failure. Uh, they didn't uh, obtain a very good clinical response. But the second generation CARS containing the, the aquastimulatory molecule was a real success. So most of the clinical trials in the world using CARS are based on this second generation CARS. Now there are other clinical trials that are being uh, running uh, with uh, two co-stimulatory molecules. They are uh, instead of one, they are called third generation CARs, and even four generations, including a gene that induces the secretion of a cytokine to attract uh, immune innate cells to the tumor to destroy cells that maybe don't have the target of, of, of the CAR, but the clinical results are based on this second generation CAR. So 
this is a protein, so we don't want to uh, incorporate just a protein in a T cell because when this T cell identifies the antigen, will proliferate, and the daughter cells uh, will not have that protein. So what we want is to incorporate in the, in the genome of the T cells genes that will codify for the chimeric antigen receptor, not only in the T cell, but also in the daughter cells when they proliferate. What we do is to use a, a virus, a gamma retrovirus or lentivirus, because they have the characteristic of reproducing their own RNA by introducing uh, into the host cell, into the host genome, their genetic material. So they introduce the genetic material into the T cell, in our, in our case, and the genetic machinery of the T cell reproduce the RNA of the, of the virus. So we take advantage of this natural characteristic of, 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 the, of the virus to introduce the genes that we want to codify for the chimeric antigen receptor. Lentivirus is the vector mostly used because they naturally infect T cells. Uh, so you see here how the, this lentivirus incorporating the genes that uh, are the genetic construct of the, of the car will be introduced in the, in the genetic, in, in the nucleus of the T cell, uh, will modify the T cell, and will express on the surface the single chain variable fragment of the monoclonal antibody, and inside the questimulatory molecule and the T cell receptor signal. So this is the chimeric body, a T cell expressing on the surface fragments of a monoclonal antibody. So, what we do in the clinic for preparation of a car is first is to have uh, T cells selected from uh, the leukapheresis product of the patient. Uh, these T cells are activated, are cultured with the virus. Uh, so this uh, virus, uh, as I commented, uh, will instruct the T cell to grow a chimeric antigen receptor on the surface of the cell that uh, will track for the cancer cell and will rip up for an attack. And these CAR cells are multiplied, are grown in a bioreactor. So millions of these CAR cells are infused intravenously to the patient. So this is a complex procedure so that is simplified with the use of commercial CARs. So there are now you may see on the screen uh, the three most important cars. Uh, the first two are already commercially available. It's from Gilead and from Novartis, and from Celgene will, be, uh, will come soon. So these three cars have in common the same monoclonal antibody. It's FMC63, the three of them. And uh, they have different co-stimulatory molecule. Uh, le uh, the, the Novartis and Celgene uh, use the 4-1-BB co-stimulatory molecule, whereas Gilead use CD28. There are differences between them. Uh, CD28 is very rapid and very potent. Uh, CD4-1-BB is slower and, uh, the, and more persistent. So, so it's good to have this, uh, this cars available, but uh, they have a high cost, and in some countries they are not available. And, and also, we consider that it's good uh, from an academic point of view uh, to incorporate some uh, improvements, innovations into the procedure, into the process, as we have done for many years in the bone marrow transplant area, um, changing the composition of the, of the graft or modifying the, the, the number of cells, uh, eliminating T cells, potentiating the number of hemopoietic progenitor cells. For that reason, we were motivated to initiate an academic program of CAR in our institution a few years ago. So for, for doing that, uh, that was a great effort, and it's been a great effort, uh, we need uh, three elements. The first element, is to have the, the lentivirus with the genetic construct of the car uh, in the lentivirus. So we were very lucky that in our team uh, there are 
uh, researchers uh, very familiar with the use of molecular biology techniques and with techniques of gene deliver. Uh, second is to use a bioreactor for multiplying the, the, the cars. Uh, so this second part maybe is not so difficult for a bone marrow transplant unit that, uh, that is familiar uh, with uh, cellular therapy procedures. Uh, and the third one, the third element, is to prepare a clinical trial. Uh, you know that the clinical trial is, all, is always a nightmare in terms of bureaucracy, documents, regulatory issues. Here, there are two uh, more difficult aspects. Uh, first is that you are the drug company. The hospital itself is the drug company. And the second is gene therapy. So we are introducing in a T cell from human that will be uh, inoculated to a person. Uh, uh, so, and these T cells may be in the blood of the person for years. So these two things uh, make the, 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 to prepare a clinical trial with CAR, with CAR very difficult in terms of regulatory agencies. So for the first element to prepare the antivirus, we uh, started with our own monoclonal antibody. So we have uh, in, in, in our, in our uh, immunology department uh, a monoclonal antibody that was prepared 20 years ago, and is, the clone is A3B1. Uh, I emphasize this because it's different to the rest of commercial cars, which are FMC63. This is different. Uh, so this, uh, the, 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 the single chain fra uh, variable fragments of this monoclonal antibody are, uh, are linked to a co-stimulatory, are combined with a co-stimulatory molecule for one BB and the CD3 signal. These uh, fragments are cloned into a vector. We have used a uh, lentivirus of third generation. Uh, so to codify, this lentivirus will codify for the synthesis of the, mono of the chimeric antigen receptor. Uh, uh, first, what we did is to test the efficacy of our car. So what we did is to uh, this is in red. Our car is in, in red. So what uh, we uh, put in culture uh, our car with cell lines expressing CD19. You know that most of the cars uh, uh, has, have been produced for, for uh, malignancies expressing CD19. So we uh, put in culture with the uh, malignant cell line, NALM6, expressing CD19. So the, you may see the, sur the survival of these cells expressing CD19 in combination with our car, so uh, very effective, eliminating NALM6 uh, cells. And we compared our results first with untransduced T cells, so T cells without the car. So you may see that T cells without the car didn't destroy, didn't eliminate NALM6 cells. And also with the standard car, car expressing FMC63. So you may see that in principle, the activity of our car was very similar to the standard to the standard car. So we did the same thing not only in vitro but also in in vivo in mice. Uh, here are the mice that inoculated with NALM6, the malignant cell line, and untransduced uh, T cells. So there were there was a progression of the tumor. Mice were sacrificed. Here is the combination of NALM6 with the standard commercial monoclonal antibody, the commercial car. Uh, is clean, so very effective, and also with our car, uh, NALP6 with our car that also eliminated the, the, the progression of the tumor and mice were alive. So uh, it seemed that our car were effect was effective, uh, so we, uh, to put this car into the patient, you need to uh, scale up the production, not only for a few cells, but for for 100 million of T cells. So you need to expand the lentiviral production. Uh, we have a GMP facility in our school of medicine, so in the same hospital, at the school of medicine of the, uh, of the hospital. It's a quite sophisticated uh, facility. The important point is that this facility may have, uh, at the entrance, very high pressure. 
intermediate pressure uh, uh, in the middle of the uh, of the facility, and at the end, uh, in uh, where technicians uh, manage the the lentivirus is low pressure. This is to avoid the way out uh, of the lentiviral the lentiviral particles. So first element was prepared. The second element is uh, the bioreactor. Uh, we had uh, several doubts of, of what bioreactor, bioreactor use. Finally, we decided to have this one, the Prodigy, because it's closed and it's automatic, so it simplifies things. So, uh, and, and here you may put just yes, the 100 million T cells uh, in fact, uh, uh, activate, uh, you may activate the, the T cells in the, in the same device and uh, to culture with the virus and um, multiply, expand the, the, the car also in the, in the device. So very convenient uh, device for doing cars in a, in, in, in a hospital. So we have already treated, this was uh, one year and a half ago uh, that uh, with these three elements uh, were already uh, were approved. So we have included already 31 patients that have received our car. Uh, most of them were ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, because uh, you know that this car is effective in ALL and in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, but the urgent, urgent need of, of the car uh, was in patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, most of them relapsing after analogenic stem cell transplantation, but also we administer in four diffuse large B cell lymphoma and in one CLL patient. So the efficacy of, of uh, our CAR, uh, we have uh, 26 patients with ALL, 16 with active disease at the moment of, of, of administering CARs, 10 patients were in remission. So. All patients we had uh, active disease uh, achieve complete remission, and, and all of them, 26, all develop uh, elimination of normal B cells. So the efficacy of the car was, uh, uh, was uh, no, no question about it. So after a follow-up of 8.5 months, uh, we have seen seven relapses of, of these 26 uh, cases, most of them uh, after the relapse, the blasts express CD19, so probably was due to a elimination of our CAR due to an immune rejection or because these T cells enter into an exhaustion, exhaustion uh, situation. And th two cases were CD19, so probably just the, the change, the shift of the CD19, so the CARs uh, were active, but the uh, blast didn't express uh, CD19. So this is one case with a CLL, uh, that the, the, the only case uh, with CLL that we treated. Uh, this was a woman that uh, came to our hospital uh, one year and a half, uh, in principle to enter in the bone marrow transplant program, uh, analogenic transplant. The, the donor was, was not very good. Uh, so we discussed with her the possibility of uh, administering a car. So she... Uh, uh, she thought about the pros and cons of allogenic bone marrow transplant or, or a car. She uh, had been refractory to five lines of, of treatment. So finally, she decided to enter into our clinical trial with, with CAR. Uh, so you, you see here uh, not only the lymphadenopathies in the axilla, but also here is the CD19, CD5 uh, leukemic cells before administering CAR and after administering CAR. Uh, so now, one year and a half, uh, one year and a half later, uh, she is in complete remission with minimal residual disease negative. One month uh, after the car administration, she went back to the the the, the hospital, the, the the origin, the the, the, the her uh, origin city. So this is this is something that we are uh, very happy is the difference between the the the, the long term uh, sequela. Uh, allogenic bone marrow transplant with respect to, to CAR. So the quality of life is very good after, after CAR administration. So results in malignant hemopathies. Uh, CARs have been used in a lot of solid tumors in many hematological malignancies, but the clinical success uh, is basically in malignancies expressing CD19, so in B cell uh, malignancies, ALL, no, different types of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, 
also in, in multiple myeloma, uh, not expressing CD19, but expressing BCMA. So here is the, 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 what you would expect from a cohort of patients with ALL in, in relapse. Overall survival after five years of follow-up is uh, less than 10%. And these results uh, have improved with the administration of blinatumumab or inotuzumab, but even though, and even combining uh, 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 inotuzumab with a bone marrow transplant, the uh, disease-free survival is lower than 30%. And here you may see the results of uh, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia in relapse treated with a CAR. This is the University of Pennsylvania uh, experience and this is the, the, the so one, just one institution, and the LIANA, so it's a, a multinational, multi-center study, identical results that, uh, that have been confirmed after longer follow-up, so one year and a half after the administration of the CAR, uh, the results are identical, so it's 50% of disease-free survival, one year and a half, uh, when we expected less than 10%. Uh, you may see here how most of the people, most of the patients, uh, enter into complete remission with the CAR. Even those patients uh, relapsing after allogenic stem cell transplantation. But unfortunately, there are there there is 30 percent of relapses. So this is the problem of CAR in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. That it seems that per se, on its own, is not enough uh, because there are cases that relapse after CAR administration. Uh, one interesting point is that we have changed the paradigm of prognostic factors. So the, the, for CAR administration and for the clinical result with the, with the CAR administration, uh, the prognostic factors are different to the standard chemotherapy, either molecular, uh, either molecular mutations or cytogenetic changes or refractory to other lines of treatment. Here with the CAR is just CD19 expression. CD19 expression the cancer cell is destroyed. So you may see here how the disease burden is barely influenced, the, the, the complete remission rate. The same for patients that have received already an allogenic transplant and have relapsed after the most intensive treatment we have, hematologies, an allogenic stem cell transplantation, enter again in complete remission after CAR administration, the number of lines of treatment, or Philadelphia positive cases that enter into remission, most, most of them. So there are cases that relapse. Uh, the reason is that uh, some case, in some cases, uh, when the, the relapse is CD19 is due to the immune rejection of the CAR because this, uh, the extracellular domain is murine in, in the origin, so uh, it creates uh, immune rejection of, of this CAR. Second reason is exhaustion of T cell because we are using T cells from the patient that have received multiple lines of treatment that have been in contact with uh, a mass of antigen in the body of, of the patient. So maybe using more fresh T cells results would be uh, a bit different. And also there are 20%, uh, 25% of cases that relapse not expressing CD19. This is due to the, to the, to the blast that if uh, alleukemic cells don't contain, don't express, uh, doesn't express uh, CD19 will not be attacked by the, uh, by the uh, car, yes, Darwin, Darwin would say what, what you are expecting. Okay, so non-Hodgkin lymphoma, very similar situation uh, in the sense that uh, with uh, patients that were in refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the prognosis was extremely poor, uh, less than 10% of patients are alive five years after starting the treatment. And with CAR, uh, results are very similar to ALL, in terms of disease-free survival 18 months after CAR administration. is 40% of the patients, one year and a half after CAR administration, are, uh, are alive and free of, of disease. The difference uh, between lymphoma and ALL is that in ALL, most of the patients achieve complete remission, but there are relapses. In non-Hodgkin lymphoma, is from the beginning, there are patients that do not respond. But once the patient has obtained a complete remission, most of them will not relapse. So it seems that in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the CAR is enough and is not necessarily a complement of treatment like it seems to be the case 
in, in, in ALL. CLL uh, results are extremely good, uh, especially if uh, we treat the patients with ibrutinib before and after CAR administration. It seems that it restores the T cell function of the patients with CLL. So most of them achieve a complete remission and even in, in lymph node. Multiple myeloma, uh, expectations were very, very high. Uh, at the beginning when uh, uh, different groups started to use uh, a CAR uh, identifying BCMA, the, the, the antigen expressed in, 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 plasmatic, in plasma cells and also in major B cells, but mainly, mainly in, in plasma cell. Uh, so there were uh, like 50% of the patients after five, seven lines of treatments achieved a complete remission with the BCMA car. So uh, people were, was, were very excited. Unfortunately, uh, the patients are relapsing. So this is a shame. Uh, it seems that one of the reasons may be that uh, T cells are exhausted because in a patient with multiple myeloma, T cells are uh, in, in contact with, the, with a massive quantity of, of, of the antigen for, for many years. And other reason, I, I don't know whether you may click on, on, the, on the screen or... Okay, so you may see another reason, maybe you may see in, in blue are CAR T cells and in green are BCMA. So you may see here how a CAR is attacking a, a, a multiple myeloma cells. Perfect, this is good. But also you may see that a plasma cell is releasing a vesicle of BCMA. So this would eliminate the BCMA from the plasma cells and also you may see how a CAR T cell is capturing this vesicle. Another CAR T cell is fighting with the other CAR for this vesicle. So they are fighting each, uh, together, each other, and leaving the plasma cell alive. So it's like a real life. No? So, okay, uh, so this is multiple myeloma case and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, different, uh, a, a different antigen, uh, CD30. You, see, you know that in uh, resistant cell, uh, uh, there, are, there is a expression of CD30. So there are uh, very promising results in, 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 in Hodgkin lymphoma using this CD30. In other hematological malignancies, uh, like T cell malignancies or myeloid malignancies, the problem is that it's very difficult to find an antigen uh, that is expressed in T cell. It's expressed in, in malignant T cells and not on the car. So the problem is that there will be a fratricide. So uh, a CAR T cell against uh, CD3, against CD2, against CD5, uh, CD5 will have a, a fratricide against the other, uh, against each, each other. And the problem is that uh, the, the eliminating T cells, malignant and normal, you will create a cellular immunodeficiency in the patient. With respect to myeloid malignancies, difficult to find an antigen that is expressed in, uh, in, in the malignant cells and not on the normal hemopoietic progenitor cells. So the problem is that with a CAR, CD1, 2, 3, you may see, uh, that we are preparing also one CAR for, for that. Uh, the problem is that you also eliminate, we have seen very, uh, and other groups, that you eliminate normal hemopoietic progenitor cells so the patient would die of anaplastic anemia unless you perform analogenic stem cell transplantation. So uh, finally, the general, general comments. First is that uh, CAR administration is associated uh, with complications. Cytokine release syndrome is the most common. Uh, uh, the important point is this cytokine release syndrome is a temporary complication. So the patients solving this situation, they don't have sequela. Uh, they don't have long-term complication as, as patients uh, from allergen, allergenic bone marrow transplantation. So a patient with a cytokine release syndrome, the hallmark is fever, uh, temporary uh, te with a temporal association with the CAR administration. Fever is the most important sign of, the, of, of, of this syndrome. 
hypotension, dyspnea, due to the uh, capillary leak syndrome and other, and other complications. So we have seen in these 31 patients that uh, there is a clear association of uh, the risk of cytokine release syndrome with bulky disease. If you have a lot of cells expressing the antigen, you will have a massive expansion of CARS. So uh, you will have a release of cytokines. So bulky disease is a problem. High dose of CARS. In fact, we have fractionated the number of CARS that we administer now to our patients. We administer at the beginning 10% uh, of our dose. If the patient, uh, if the patient does not uh, develop a cytokine release syndrome, we administer 30%. If not, we administer 60%. Uh, an important point is disease uh, is in ALL is more frequent and more severe than in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And also the problem of adults in ALL are more frail than children. So although the, 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 the efficacy of the CAR in ALL is very similar in adults as compared to children, uh, the consequences uh, are worse in terms of cytokine release syndrome. We have had a couple of patients dying due to cytokine release syndrome uh, in adult, in adult patients. So uh, finally is the, 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 the classification of, 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 this, uh, of this cytokine release syndrome. There is a very recent uh, publication, very good. I, I, I would like to advise you to read the paper. Uh, is, uh, is you, you may see the reference, and is how to classify the, the, the grade of, of the cytokine release syndrome and in which situation to administer the an antidote to the interleukin-6 uh, 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 receptor uh, with uh, tocilizumab. So when the patient develops uh, hypotension requiring vasopressors, tocilizumab, or the patient uh, uh, develops uh, uh, dyspnea, and requires high flow of oxygen, tocilizumab. So the trends in CAR therapy first is that due to this immune rejection to the murine part of the chimeric antigen receptor, uh, uh, we are developing a human or humanized uh, chimeric antigen receptors. So we, uh, we will start in September a clinical trial with a BCMA CAR but instead of murine, we have humanized the, 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 chimeric, the, the monoclonal antibody fragment, trying to uh, avoid this immune rejection of the, of, the, of, the, of the patient. Duals is, uh, if one of the reasons is that CD19 is not expressed, uh, is to give a car uh, against CD19 and also against CD20 or CD22, trying to avoid uh, the uh, release of this blast not expressed in CD19 with two co-stimulatory molecules, as I mentioned, third generation cars, fourth generation cars with uh, tracks, universal cars eliminating the T cell receptor or using natural killer cells to avoid the preparation of the car from the patient, is just to have off the self cars for clinic for immediate clinical use if necessary. And also other, you know, other aspects, like, for instance, the lymphodepletive regimen, which is fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, is the standard. Or the CAR administration, as I mentioned, instead of giving one dose, is to fractionate the dose, just to see if, for that particular patient, if is enough a lower number of CARs. You may see that, uh, that the CAR is not a conventional drug. When you administer a drug, uh, you administer 100 milligrams, but these 100 milligrams will decrease more or less uh, rapidly, but will decrease. In the case of CAR, is you administer certain quantity of CARs, one million per kilogram, but this million may duplicate or triplicate or multiply by 10 once this CAR has detected the, 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 the antigen. So it's a, a, a live drug, uh, so it's much more difficult to control not only the efficacy of the car, but also the secondary effects. So this is the team uh, uh, of, the, of the hospital clinic. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a multidisciplinary team. So uh, I think this is one of the projects in which I have seen uh, the, 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 the importance of having researchers, the molecular biologists, integrated in the team. Even they are in the world round discussing the patients because we don't understand many, uh, some complications of, of, of the patients and how to improve uh, and to eliminate these complications. So uh, basic researchers are very, are very important. And 
Thank you very much. Es pasiva. <laughs> Alvaro. So, please, colleagues, do you have uh, a questions, please? From perhaps, audience, perhaps or I, please. I, will start. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to ask a question regarding um, your 26 LL patients. I saw that there were 10 of them in CR, and you have seven relapses. And these relapses occur in those who were in CR before CAR T cells, or in those who were uh, relapsed or refractory. And um, this CR was only morphological, or it was uh, uh, molecular, etc. So would you like okay, okay. to yeah, comment on this yeah, point? Yeah. yeah, thank you for thank you for your for your question. Uh, hmm. Yeah, first is to explain why we administer the CAR. Uh, for patients in complete remission, even minimal residual disease negative. This was due to, uh, that uh, these patients achieve that complete remission uh, with a bridge therapy, that we knew that this result, this complete remission, would last for just one month, two months, three months, as the most. So that was the reason although they were in complete remission, was a temporary complete, complete remission. So relapses uh, have, uh, we have seen relapses not only in patients with uh, bulky disease, but also in complete remission. So, and practically all of the cases were after allogenic bone marrow transplant, so we can't define uh, whether relapses are higher or not after uh, allogenic bone marrow transplant. But I think that the, 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 although it's, a, it's something important with the final results, the bulky disease, especially for cytokine release syndrome, in our cases, it seems that was not an important factor for relapse of the patient. The quantity of the blasts at the at, uh, in, in the moment at the moment of administering the cars, it seems more important the persistence of the car for for relapse. Okay, thank you. So, so please, Professor Foa. Alvaro, thank you. I, I would have brought up the same points, uh, and we discussed this a few days ago. In fact, in Frankfurt, just a couple of comments and one question. I mean. The fact that we're treating CR patients at risk or MRD positive, I think that's the logical follow-up. I mean, if CAR T go on, if they're doable, obviously, it's not to treat a fifth relapse. It'll, go, it'll be incorporating CAR T earlier in order to prevent relapse, to con keep patients, to try to cure them. I mean, I think that's going to be the end point. And in fact, I think a trial was supposed to start to treat MRD positive ALL, so CR, MRD positive. It slowed down because obviously now they have to produce enough CAR T for the commercial. So it's a, uh, a slowdown of the uh, studies, obviously. The question I wanted to pose to you, Alvaro, is what happens, I mean, what you did or what you would do? I mean, let's say a patient goes into complete remission after CAR T and has a donor. Do you transplant them all or do you wait? But this is a key point. I mean, if the, if the patient becomes MRD negative, a complete molecular response, do you transplant or do you wait? Because this is one of the key issues, obviously, because you can be cured only with CAR T. So that, I think, is one of the key points. I mean, I remember we asked, there was a recent presentation by, this is just to give you an idea how the world is going, by the Chinese colleague, mm. whom I, in fact, I know because I've been to her center in Shanghai. They presented publicly data on I don't want to diminish what Alvaro said because this is done in health. They have done 500 ALLs treated in one center. I, I'm just I'm repeating that the figures they gave. Mm -hmm. China is always a difficult world. Mm -hmm. Over 500. And one of the question is what do you do? And they transplanted them all, if possible, after CAR T, irrespective of degree response. So it was CAR T plus transplant. So just imagine what this would be in terms of costs and practicality. But that's a different issue. Would you transplant them all? I think that's one of the key points that we don't really know. Because as I see it personally, in the future, I think it, we hope to do less transplants, to use a CAR T to avoid the transplant, mm -hmm. if we're going in that direction, which I think we are. Yeah, yeah so uh, yeah, thank you, Robin. I think it's a key question. Uh, so first is that uh, patients that were in complete remission had previously relapsed after allogenic 
uh, they, they had previously relapsed after allogenic stem cell transplant. So we knew that would relapse in one month, two months. So second is with respect to the Chinese group, uh, that is impressive the number of cases that uh, have uh, included in the, in, in the clinical trial, and it's impressive the number of clinical trials they have. So now China with the uh, United States are the two focus of, of, of uh, CAR administration. So, and they are... Uh, they are giving, uh, providing uh, very important information to the car world. But with respect to the ALL, uh, the, their approach is different. Their approach is to use, uh, 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 to administer a small quantity of cars, 50,000 uh, uh, per kilogram, so it's a very tiny quantity of cars, to obtain a complete remission using as a bridge to allogenic stem cell transplantation. So it's different to, the, to, uh, to use, uh, to our aim, to our goal of trying to cure the patient uh, with one million, three million, five million cars per kilogram. They use a very small quantity of car uh, as a bridge for allogenic stem cell transplantation. If they don't do this, the allogenic transplant, the patient will relapse because the quantity uh, is too small. And one of the reasons is economical. So they say that they can't afford for using blinatumumab, inotuzumab, or things like that. So they prefer just, just uh, 50,000 cars per kilogram, and after that, the allogenic transplant. In our situation, it's, uh, it's very difficult to say. It's, uh, because uh, if the patient is cured, and you perform a second allogenic transplant, and the patient die after a second allogenic stem cell transplant, it's very difficult. Uh, the, so what we are doing is, uh, is if, if, if the car is CD28, I think that you need a bridge. For, uh, so you need analogenic stem cell transplantation because CD28 is short persistent. So the relapse rate is high. Using a 4-1-BB, as in our case, what we do is a very close monitoring of minimal residual disease with uh, next generation sequencing. And if uh, it is negative, we don't plan uh, analogenic stem cell transplantation. Uh, the age of the patient, comorbidity index, uh, uh, so is uh, the, the, the patient what, what he she wants. So it's, it's very, very different. It's a second allogenic stem cell transplantation. So it's a very difficult question. Okay. Do we have time? If we have time. No, the, it, yeah, no, this is a very quick, I mean, it, it's a key point, but what, as I see it, patient relapse, I think this is an open question. But if you use them fr uh, front after induction treatment and they go into COVID molecular, I guess in the future we probably reduce the transfer and monitor very closely. Mm -hmm. This is coming up with blinatumumab. I mean, we have these protocols where we, we discuss it tomorrow, putting blina up front with a, a patient become molecular negative, we are not transplanting. But it's first line, mm -hmm. different from what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. For your comments. So we will continue and so your cases, please, and okay. we will discuss. So please. Uh, so I'm continuing with the the, the, the cases or, or Your cases. Some... Your cases. Okay. Yes. Mm. Okay. So no, we will change this. Situation. <laughs> okay. So please, uh, I, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the. This, please introduce you, Professor Vadim Ptushkin, and uh, he has. Uh, two cases, and we will discuss them. Excuse me, Alvaro. <laughs> uh, dear colleagues, dear faculty, I would like to thank for the possibility to discuss my cases. Uh, uh, the first of uh, them is a young female patient who had a problem in 2014 after the cold exposure. She she felt herself bad and uh, asked for a doctor's consultation. Diagnosis of pneumonia was done and a short course of antibiotics was prescribed. With just moderate improvement, a uh, fever dissolved, but uh, the cough was prolonged. And she asked the second consultation and, uh, in cancer research center uh, with a uh, investigation in LCT scanning uh, large tumor mass in upper mediastinal was seen and uh, 
patient uh, uh, receive a recommendation to perform bronchoscopy with biopsy. It was performed and on pathology examination, <coughs> uh, specialists saw rich Turnberg cells with uh, um, moderate uh, eosinophil infiltration. Diagnosis of Hodgkin classical lymphoma was done, and uh, after the staging, after the staging, uh, the fourth, uh, fourth uh, stage of Hodgkin disease with a moment of a lot of peripheral lymph nodes, mediastinal and uh, f uh, lung focuses uh, with no uh, bone marrow involvement. Uh, after the diagnosis was done, she immediately uh, received a first cycle of chemotherapy. It was EACOP. It was a uh, study in course uh, looking like classical BCOP 14 uh, with a difference of substitution bleomycin with etoposide. Uh, this uh, protocol was done in cooperation with German study in Hodgkin lymphoma group of Yelena Dumina in Cancer Research Center, and uh, the patient received eight cycles in six months. That's why timing was good. And uh, complete uh, PT neg uh, PET scan negative remission was uh, diagnosed. Unfortunately, soon after, just a few months, she uh, observed enlargement of uh, supraclavicular lymph nodes and on PT scanning, a uh, relapse of disease was diagnosed. Second question was uh, what to do with uh, this early uh, relapse. Um, it was a rather, rather intensive first-line treatment. That's why uh, the second biopsy was performed and classical Hodgkin lymphoma was confirmed in the second, second biopsy. Uh, that's why patient was recommended to move to a uh, second line chemotherapy, it was DIAP. Unfortunately, after uh, three DIAP courses, uh, progression on treatment was seen, and uh, uh, third line with Dexabeam was performed. After two cycles of uh, Dexabeam treatment, partial remission was uh, induced. Unfortunately, it was PET positive situation with grade four on Deville. Nevertheless, high-dose chemotherapy was performed with cyclophosphamide, etoposite, RC, and melphalan course of high-dose chemotherapy with peripheral stem cell rescue. Unfortunately, soon after, <coughs> the third relapse occur, and we have a problem uh, with a young uh, female patient uh, uh, with uh, absolutely chemo-resistant Hodgkin lymphoma disease and uh, no donor on consultation with the uh, um, uh, possibility of uh, uh, allogenic stem cell transplantation and no remission. That's why a uh, uh, patient moved to uh, brentuximab vidutin, uh, one uh, 0.8 milligrams per kilo with uh, uh, induction of remission after four infusions, but unfortunately, rapid progression after nine infusions. That's why is a double refractory so-called situation, and only way to try to resolve it was to move uh, to immunotherapy, uh, and uh, it's a of course, very interesting field of treatment, some resistant uh, lymphoma disease, and in excellent uh, presentation of Professor uh, Alvaro Urbana Espizo, we received the same information. She tried uh, to um, treat with nivolumab infusions. After first infusion, she felt herself much better. B symptoms disappeared, but unfortunately, we saw hepatotoxicity with uh, elevation of uh, uh, ASTLT uh, ferments uh, and uh, um, symptoms of uh, symptoms of uh, um, uh, 
and symptoms of uh, some problems in abdominal <coughs> region. Uh, uh, therapy with nivolumab was stopped. Uh, prednisone uh, began to infuse. Uh, all the symptoms of hepatotoxicity uh, disappeared, and nivolumab after two weeks of uh, stopping was resolved. She is now after six, and uh, it's uh, old information, after nine infusion of nivolumab in very good status. And uh, for my last information, she graduated medical institute. Unfortunately, she would like to become a stomato st stomatologist, uh, but not hematologist. Nevertheless, uh, she is an ECOG-1, and we have uh, uh, idea, we have no idea how to maybe and necessary to consolidate the situation. It's the first case. If you have a questions, please. Кто-нибудь хочет задать вопросы из аудитории, пожалуйста? I would like to ask two questions. Did you test for P53 mutation in this case, as she was heavily no. chemo-resistant? No, we, uh, we didn't uh, perform it in Hodgkin lymphoma situations usually. I don't know, is it necessary? Mm -hmm. Maybe Robin says. But in such a case of uh, so chemo-resistant? Maybe. 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 And the second question, do you suggest hapla identical transplantation for her yes it's a, it's a good idea it's still a high <coughs> possibility to relapse mm -hmm. of course in uh, immunotherapy that's why I, I i think my personal opinion is it's necessary to consolidate it mm -hmm. uh, this remission maybe with haplo identical mm -hmm. okay so our foreign colleagues maybe have con comments or, or question so, please. Well, the last question, I think, was that uh, in the young patient, if there, is, if there is a response to anti-PD-1, would it be horrible? Do you usually try to proceed it? Okay. So it's, it's working. Uh, we usually try to proceed the patient treated with uh, anti-PD-1 after Brentos and Bedotin failure to Allo uh, transplant in case aploidentical in Oshkin could be a, a good of effect. Course. Of course, we have to consider that there are some more uh, GBHD uh, uh, effect after anti PD1, but I believe it is manageable, at least in our experience, if we stop anti PD1 at least a couple of months before mm -hmm. allo transplant. Uh, we had uh, some patients that we were able uh, to put in complete remission and uh, follow up without a severe GVHD. Mm -hmm. GVHD is higher than standard GVHD without NTPD1, but it's feasible. I abso think. absolutely agree, but uh, we have no donor till now. That's why maybe haploidentical it yeah. may be option. So we will continue. Okay. Yes, yeah. I, I hope so. <coughs> you hope so. Uh, okay. Second, okay, maybe second, questions? Yeah. No? Uh, so move to the second question is uh, more complicated, maybe. It's also a young, uh, young uh, woman, uh, 32 years old, and she started uh, her problems with abdominal pain. <coughs> move to surgeon. He uh, take a look at her and say that maybe some um, spasmolytic therapy will be interesting. And uh, uh, after starting on spasmolytic the pain disappeared, but two months later, she became yellow uh, and uh, uh, moved to a second, uh, uh, second hospital <coughs> with a uh, dark urine and uh, colorless stool. Um, and uh, um, in this hospital, she was studying, uh, and uh, she received a stent in Holedoch with disappearing uh, symptoms of uh, holostatic jaundice. Uh, but uh, soon after, she uh, became, um, she became, uh, she received uh, symptoms of um, uh, fever and asked to a third hospital. It was cancer uh, center in Moscow region. 
and um, in this center uh, uh, she uh, was studied uh, with CT uh, scanning and uh, symptoms of uh, some uh, organ involvement with mediastinal mass and abdominal mass in a region of pancreatic. Uh, after that, she moved to a Botkin hospital, and in Botkin hospital, uh, we observed a symptom of cholecystitis, and a cholecystectomy was performed. Also, she received biopsy of uh, tumor in uh, region of pancreas and in uh, upper mediastinal region, and we received a, a morphology picture of uh, large cell lymphoma. Soon after, she received PET-CT uh, investigation, and we observed a lot of involvement, including peripheral lymph nodes, upper mediastinal, uh, abdominal region. Uh, she also performed uh, biopsy of bone marrow with no signs of uh, tumor involvement of bone marrow and move then to a hematology department. First cycle was our job. Uh, Fever disappeared. She uh, felt herself much better. <coughs> and then uh, uh, we tried to perform ERDA approach uh, as a sign of primary mediastinal uh, lymphoma was signed in uh, investigation of pathology preparates. She was very good uh, uh, in this treatment. Uh, pancreatic tumor disappeared at all, and uh, mediastinal mass disappeared at 70%. <laughs> That's why uh, we uh, remove a stent from Haledov. But soon after, uh, uh, we observed a uh, reappearance of fever, a reappearance of uh, problems with uh, jaundice. <coughs> and uh, in uh, control PET-CT scanning, we observed a progression of disease. Um, also, we observed uh, problems in liver and signs of uh, infected hematoma in liver was seen. Uh, and uh, soon after, we perform operation with drainage of this infected hematoma with good effect. And, but nevertheless, uh, that time tumor progressed, and we tried to stop it with moderate intensive chemotherapy of bendamastin uh, with uh, dexamethasone. She received two cycles. Unfortunately, during this treatment, we observed signs of progression of her disease. I moved to second line treatment, D up, uh, with a very high signs of uh, hematot hematotoxicity and infection toxicity. Move it to move it to ice, but soon after the uh, starting of the D up or ice, we observed just. 10 years after we observed the signs of progression of disease. That's why she uh, showed us uh, resistance to DIAP and DIs. Our experience with primary resistant mediastinal lymphoma is very, very poor, unfortunately. That's why uh, we have to decide what to do in this situation. And, uh, um, idea was to try experimental regimens. Uh, to that moment, we received some information about short uh, papers in abstract form with a combination of brentuximab vidotin with nivolumab uh, with objective effect about 70% with moderate toxicity. We tried to perform this experimental regimen. Uh, we try to perform this uh, 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 regimen and uh, induce, uh, after the first cycle, very pronounced anti-tumor effect. All the uh, uh, all this uh, um, uh, focus of disease disappeared, and we perform uh, uh, 
high dose chemotherapy with uh, stem cell transplantation. She was in a very good effect uh, in this situation, and now she moved to allogenic stem cell transplantation. We plan to perform it on May, so it's uh, uh, maybe in next month. That's all. Thank you. Спасибо. Какие будут вопросы? Наверняка у каждого из докторов есть случаи рефрактерного течения ДБККЛ, и, думаю, сталкиваемся с этим нередко. Неужели нет вопросов? Just a moment, mm -hmm. Спасибо большое за интересный случай. Скажите, пожалуйста, вот первичная медицинальная лимфома с поражением паховых повздошных узлов. Вот я сейчас сижу, перебираю в голове, что-то не могу вспомнить ни одного больного своего, у которого была бы такая клиническая картина. Это первый вопрос. Второй бар... вопрос. При первичной медицинальной лимфомы CD30 экспрессию вы не смотрели, по крайней мере, она не стояла у вас в ГХ. Чаще всего она все-таки определяется. Смотрели ли вы ее или нет? Два вопроса. Я с вами согласен, и изначально диагноз первичной медиастинальной лимфомы не стоял, стоял диагноз диффузной Б-крупноклеточной лимфомы с медиастинальным поражением. Но при пересмотре препаратов повторно, мнение патологов сложилось, что этот случай можно рассматривать как первичную медиастинальную, cd CD30 там была. Если нет вопросов, спасибо большое. Thank you. So, профессор Альваро, please. So, we can... so it's your turn. Move. Excuse me, but... <laughs> okay, so uh, we will proceed with a couple of cases uh, from... Maybe we have uh, comments. Maybe we have a comments uh, of this. Cases of... Oh, well, uh, both are very difficult cases, and in both cases uh, are examples of uh, the use of checkpoints uh, inhibitor because for instance Hodgkin lymphoma mm -hmm. I think that is the champion in the in in in, in solid tumors uh, with the response to uh, PD1 uh, monoclonal antibodies because the Hodgkin lymphoma constitutively express PDL1 so this is one of the samples and the other is primary mediastinal also with respect to other diffuse large B cell lymphoma is is the the case that express more more PDL1. So I think that they are both good examples of, of uh, uh, success of nivolumab or, or, or other anti-PDL1. Anti so uh, I, I think that the, the, the comments, uh, I totally agree with respect to the first case, an aploidentical transplant, I think that maybe mm -hmm. would be beneficial for, for, for the patient. And the second, uh, uh, I have a conflict of interest, so I think that CART uh, maybe it would be one of the one of the uh, therapeutic options if if available. No? <laughs> yes. And what do you think about the comments of Professor Tumian? How often do you see the primary mediastinal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma so advanced? Uh, the, the 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 proportion. The... So the, the diagnosis is primary mediastinal ah, okay. lymphoma, uh -huh. but the process is so advanced. Okay, so uh, we are a referral center, so uh, we see many cases uh, with primary mediastinal uh, and refractory. So in fact, the first two, and, and with bad response to treatment, in, in fact, the two first cases that we treated with CAR were primary mediastinal uh, lymphoma. So uh, it's quite, it's unfortunately, it's quite, it's quite frequent. Okay. It's uh, at least okay. in a referral, referral center. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And again, coming, coming to CAR T cells, mm -hmm. do you use um, um, dual or triple CARs for uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphomas? Do you have such an experience? Because we know that in China, sometimes they do use three CARs, anti-CD, 22, anti-CD19, yeah. anti-CD30 hmm. in one patient hmm. for um, yeah, yeah. non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, so we are uh, entering into a clinical trial uh, with a CD19, a CD22 that we have prepared in, a, in, in our center, and it's expressed 
in the same genetic construct. So the same genetic construct uh, uh, has uh, two uh, antigen receptors. So uh, other groups, as you mentioned, what they have, uh, uh, they have prepared is the culture of the T cells with uh, two different lentivirus uh, uh, and both containing different, uh, uh, different construct. So there will be in that T cell population cars against CD19, other cars against uh, uh, CD20 or CD22, and T cells with both. And they have already used these cars in clinical setting and, and other American groups as well. But the clinical results, as far as I know, uh, uh, are not, has been have been presented in the, in the US, but results were not uh, striking. Or, uh, so we must see whether uh, uh, dual, uh, uh, dual cars targeting two antigens will be clinically more effective than uh, targeting, targeting one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So well, there is no comments and questions, so we will continue, please. Okay, I will try. Okay. Introduce your cases. Good. Uh, so uh, uh, next slide. Ah, ah, yes, you are right. No, yes, yes, sorry. Yes. Sorry, I forgot it. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, so, uh, mm, mm, so the, the first case is uh, to discuss mainly uh, cytokine release syndrome, how to manage the cytokine release syndrome. But there are other aspects that uh, we may discuss. So it's a, uh, it's a male of uh, 54 years old uh, with diffuse large uh, B cell lymphoma, double hit. Uh, with a, a in, in 4A a stage, uh, very aggressive with rapid progression, uh, key 67, I think was 90%. So he was treated uh, with uh, what we say Burkimab therapy, very intensive treatment. You may see at the bottom of the slide, of the slide uh, the, the drugs that are composed of the Burkimab. There are several cycles. At the end of the different cycles, the patient achieves a complete remission, and we proceed uh, to an autologous stem cell transplantation. is is not typical in our group. Uh, is also is always in second complete remission. But this case was so aggressive and so uh, uh, massive disease, a bulky disease, that we proceed to an autologous stem cell transplantation. Unfortunately, eight months after the autologous stem cell transplantation uh, relapsed. Uh, we tried uh, different treatments. The first was high doses of, of methotrexate, no, no response. So finally, uh, a, a palliative regimen with cyclophosphamide and prednisone was started just to avoid progression of the disease. Uh, within the group uh, uh, was discussed the possibility of doing with bulky disease uh, the analogenic stem cell transplantation, 50 four years old uh, with a apparently good donor. Okay, so so what is the preferred, whoop. yes. So what is the preferred therapeutic option? First is, that's it. So just continue with on palliative treatment. Second is try more intensive chemotherapy. Uh, Third is to use an anti-PD-1 monoclonal antibody. Four is to go ahead with the allogenic stem cell transplantation. And five uh, is uh, now, now uh, CAR T cells. Mm -hmm. uh, коллеги, активируйте сначала все uh, нашу систему, чтобы она у вас за загорелась, и тогда мы будем голосовать. So, okay, we can start. Пожалуйста, голосуйте. Нет, я думаю, что не Галумак выберут. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, I, 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 well, I, I, is, is what we did. Uh, the, the first is clear that no solution for the patient, very young. Uh, second is we already observed that was refractory, so no. Mm -hmm. uh, th three is uh, nivolumab uh, uh, is right. Uh, 
is, is not the typical case for uh, PD, PDL1 expression, and the response rate is low. Uh, so the re reality is that we have we had the doubt of allogenic stem cell transplantation on, although we knew that uh, the probability of entering into complete remission and long-term survival was very poor. So we decided to go to the CAR T cells. Okay, good. So uh, we entered into the clinical trial that I mentioned during my talk uh, with uh, our CAR. Uh, so we administered, uh, in ALL, we administered very low dose, one million of CARs per kilogram uh, based on bibliography. As I mentioned, this one million CAR is fractionated 10%, 30 60%. But in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, uh, most of the groups uh, have found that uh, we need more quantity of CAR to obtain a response. So we administer uh, 4.5 uh, 4 uh, millions uh, of CARs per kilogram. And up before uh, this CAR administration, uh, you know that uh, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide must be administered to not only to reduce the, the, the tumoral mass, but mainly uh, to eliminate normal T cells from the patient to permit, to allow for an expansion, an engraftment of the T cells that uh, we are, uh, of the CARs that we are administering to the patient. And also to uh, eliminate, at least uh, temporary, the immune rejection of the patient against the CAR, okay? So we did it. Uh, this was one of the first cases that we, uh, that, uh, that we, uh, would, that we did. And uh, so we didn't have very much experience in treating this uh, type of patients. And 12 hours later, uh, the whole team very nervous uh, about complications. And 12, two, 12 hours later, the patient developed 40, 40 degrees of high fever, tachycardia, and mild hypotension. OK? So. So, what is the most likely diagnosis of this complication? A systemic infection, uh, cytokine release syndrome may be excluded too early, just 12 hours after CAR administration. Second is, it is a cytokine release syndrome, a uh, high risk situation, uh, bulky disease, high risk of, of complications, so uh, administer a, 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 a Tocilizumab to block uh, re the receptor of interleukin-6. Infection is excluded. It's a temporary association with the CAR. Is grade two uh, CRS, but infection to be ruled out uh, because it, it, it could be the case. Four is just check interleukin-6 level. And if uh, this uh, interleukin-6 level is very high, Tocilizumab block the receptor for interleukin-6. Or just blood transfusion reaction, because it was the case that uh, 30 minutes before, the patient uh, had received uh, uh, blood transfusion and platelet transfusion. So, okay, so 12 hours after CAR administration, these five possibilities. 10 seconds, I think, no? начинаем голосовать. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You may see in green what we consider. Okay, so four is the the most okay, is if I okay, uh it is important to say that, uh, that cytokine release syndrome is based on clinical, clinical aspects, fever. Mm -hmm. And fever, hypotension, dyspnea uh, are not based, and, and sorry for, for tricking you, uh, 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 this, this, this syndrome is not based in, uh, in, uh, in cytokines because uh, a bacterial sepsis may rise uh, these cytokines. So uh, is what we have learned. So we have, and I will show you the, the, the levels of interleukin C's during the cytokine release syndrome, but is not the treatment and the diagnosis is not based 
um, biochemical or lab parameters. It's just clinical. So we did consider uh, that was a grade two cytokine release syndrome because it was uh, this temporal association with the CAR administration, but of course, uh, we rule out an infection. So different cultures, and even uh, uh, we administer an, uh, a broad spectrum antibiotics. So I think that number three, uh, uh, number three is the is the is the right one. But uh, uh, but I think that is something tricky because uh, we, at that point, we all we also need consider that cytokine is an important point. So whoop, sorry. So you may see here, so 12 hours after antibiotics and intravenous uh, fluids, progression, progressive hypotension, mild renal failure, febrile. So uh, again, the group nervous about the situation uh, was one of, the th one of the first three cases that we, that we treated. So uh, blood levels of interleukin Cs and gamma interferon showed a large peak no, macrobi no macrobiological findings. So things are not going well. Uh, the, the, the fever and hypotension is maintained, is not responding to uh, intravenous uh, <coughs> fluids, and it seems that there is no sepsis. And so what should, what should, oh, sorry. What should you or we do now? Is, this is a grade yeah. three cytokine release syndrome. Uh, star vasopressors, grade three cytokine release syndrome, uh, vasopressors, and tocilizumab uh, uh, in, in, the, in the bone marrow transplant unit, or just transfer the patient to the intensive care unit, and they must start vasopressors and tocilizumab, or just vasopressors, just wait before administering tocilizumab, the response to vasopressors, and not administer tocilizumab just in case the reaction of the car uh, will be uh, uh, stopped. So just wait tocilizumab to later, uh, to higher grade of cytokine release syndrome. Five is, okay, this is a bacterial uh, septic shock transferred to the intensive care unit. Okay? So glasuem. <laughs> <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. good. Uh, so, mm, so maybe more experience that we had because we had poof, many difficulties in trying to find the, the so very good, 45%. Uh, so it's a grade three cytokine release syndrome uh, uh, that was not responding to the fluid. So. Uh, vasopressors was indicated. This is one of the most important parameters to see the severity of cytokine release syndrome is to see the interventions. So if the patient is not uh, evolving well, if the patient needs to intervene with vasopressors or with high flow uh, oxygen, this is uh, uh, tocilizumab, uh, an intensive care unit. So the intensive care unit is one of the most important parts of the CART uh, procedure because uh, uh, to, mm, cytokine release syndrome is relatively easy to manage, but in, 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 in a unit that they know very well how to manage uh, multi-organ failure, uh, coagulopathies, and, and, and uh, capillary leak syndrome, and so in, even to intubate, when to intubate the patient or not. So intensive care unit, extremely important in the, in the team. So very good. So the patient was transferred to the intensive care unit. Uh, antibiotics and intravenous fluids were escalated, but we started vasopressor, low dose, and the first dose of tocilizumab. So please note that it's not necessarily high dose of noradrenaline or to add a second vasopressor. It's just start vasopressor, mm, tocilizumab. Six hours later, uh, the patient continued with fever, severe uh, hypotension, mild respiratory insufficiency, uh, no macrobiological findings, so it's getting worse uh, despite the tocilizumab. So we 
did consider uh, to increase the, 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 vaso, the dose of the vasopressors or even to add uh, corticosteroid uh, because tocilizumab was not enough or to administer a second dose of, of tocilizumab to avoid corticosteroids because, again, uh, prednisone may uh, eliminate CAR T cells and was a patient with a bulky disease uh, with no other solution in principle than, than the CAR. Uh, that the CAR. So uh, uh, for that reason, uh, corticosteroids have uh, pros and cons. Three is, uh, uh, well, the second dose of, of tocilizumab. Four is both corticosteroids and tocilizumab. Five is considered that uh, this is a sepsis to escalate antibiotics and antifungals. So what would you do in this case? The last swim. Okay, okay, number three and four were, uh, has been the, the selected. Well, uh, I think he's right. The, the fourth would be okay. Uh, we didn't use corticosteroids because we were convinced at that time that the use of corticosteroids uh, would eliminate CAR T cells. Now, it is known mm -hmm. that uh, a, a short course of uh, prednisolone uh, not, does not eliminate mm. cars. So I think that uh, number four maybe is what we would use today. Okay, so three, four, fine, but maybe now four is uh, uh, the, the right the right option. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, we administered that time uh, the second dose of tocilizumab. Uh, two hours, the fever disappeared. Uh, vasopressors going down, uh, the, ha the blood pressure going up. Uh, so seven days after, uh, after transferring the patient to the intensive care unit, again to the ward, and in three weeks after care administration, the patient at home. So very good response. So this is what we have seen. Serious difficult situation with the ooh, and, rap, and uh, uh, a very good response to tocilizumab, one dose, second dose of prednisone, again to the world, no sequela to, at home. Okay, so this is with respect to the cytokine release syndrome, and, and so the patient was at home, and two months after the, the car administration, uh, PET was very good. The, there was a complete metabolic response. Three months uh, uh, we performed a bone marrow biopsy because it was positive before car administration, bone marrow biopsy, complete remission. Three months after the car administration disappeared. Uh, it was not detectable by flow cytometry. Uh, the, what we use is a monoclonal antibody, is, a, is an antibody of GOAT, uh, anti-murine. So with this uh, antibody we detect uh, cells that have a murine in the surface of the car is the way of it. But this patient uh, uh, lost uh, his car three months after administration, and in four months, uh, we see what is the surrogate of, of car elimination, which is the B cell recovery. Okay, so the, the, the treatment disappeared. So this is the... the, the mass, the, 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 the lymphoma, before and after the CAR. Uh, here is the system to, uh, to identify the, 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 the metabolic activity. So you may see that there are different parts of metabolic activity before CAR administration. Uh, so the, even the patient had, had a, um, an important penis, penis infiltration of the, of the lymphoma. And here is after two months after the CAR. This bone marrow biopsy with uh, lymphoma infiltrating the paratrabecular area, which was negative after three months. Mm -hmm. so, so we have a patient that with a bulky disease, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, refractory to the two different treatments in relapse after autologous stem cell transplantation, now is in remission, but the patient has lost the car. Uh, so what should we do now uh, in this just Yes, watch and wait. Uh, the patient is in complete remission. Uh, uh, or maybe 
for the possibility for the risk of relapse is to do a second dose of CAR-19. Uh, uh, excuse me, again, number two is try to boost CAR-19 uh, with nivolumab. The CAR is lost, but this is one possibility, even was discussed in the group. Three is now is the best moment for doing an allogenic stem cell transplantation because the patient had an unrelated uh, 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 donor, a uh, very good match, unrelated uh, donor. So maybe now that is in complete remission, we can do it. Four is to repeat the CAR-19 infusion while the patient was in complete remission. The patient has lost the CAR. Why not, as we do normally with chemotherapy, is different cycles of chemotherapy. Why not to do the same with CAR? Is just to do a second dose, rechallenge uh, of CAR. And five is just wait and to repeat CAR-19 infusion only if CD19 positive relapse. Okay, so we have uh, 10 seconds for trying to mm. answer some things that are not uh, uh, well established, but we must make a decision. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, wait and wait. Uh, uh, to wait, I think, is the, the, the best option for sure. Because uh, uh, different to ALL, uh, patients obtaining a complete remission in non Hodgkin lymphoma, they maintain the response, the complete response. So the probability of relapse is very, very low. So in lymphoma, uh, I think that we must wait. Uh, boost CAR-19 with uh, nivolumab, 5%. I, if, there, if there are no CARs, why to, uh, to increase the persistence if there are no? Okay. Number three, consolidate response with allogenic stem cell transplantation. This is a debate uh, in ALL, but in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the, the, the probability of, of maintaining the complete remission is very, very high for that reason is 54 years old, uh, relapse after autologous stem cell transplantation, the risk is very high, so wait to the patient, uh, to the to maintenance of the, of the complete remission. Number four is repeat CAR-19 infusion while in complete remission. We have done this in three patients. So the, if the patient l lose the CAR uh, early, we administer a second dose. But we have seen that uh, the second dose uh, will not last for, let's say, two or three months uh, in a similar manner to the first infusion, but just 15 days. Because the patient, the, the, the reason for losing the CAR is immune rejection against the murine uh, part of the monoclonal antibody. So if you infuse second, a second CAR, if you do a second, a second dose, is the same CAR, you have an immune rejection uh, very rapidly. So we have seen that to repeat CAR-19 infusion with the same CAR is not, is not, uh, is not good because it's just 15 days of persistence. Mm -hmm. So number, number five is repeat only if it's CD19 positive relapse is okay, uh, uh, but with a different CAR, not with the, same, with the same CAR for the reason I mentioned. So we decided to, to wait because it's a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Different thing would be in, in, in ALL. And this is the, 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 this is the, the, the reason, no? because 50% of complete remission in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, the severe cytokine release syndrome, as we have seen in this case, rapid response to tocilizumab, as we have seen in this case, no long-term consequences after cytokine release syndrome, the, pac the patient is in extremely good shape, and the CAR-19 is for, do for these patients achieving a complete remission, most of them maintain this complete remission for one year and a half, and probably, probably most of them uh, will be cured. Okay, this is the, the this is the case. I don't know whether you have more questions. If not, I, we would proceed to the second. I just would like uh, mm -hmm. just would like to comment that for 
all of us, this is very theoretical mm. because we have only one center in Russia mm. producing CAR T cells. This is a center for pediatric uh, mm -hmm. malignancies. Mm. So we hope that in one, two years there will be another one center. Uh -huh. But uh, nevertheless, we have only patients coming to us from China. Mm -hmm. So there, we have some, uh, not companies, but we have some centers in China where we can send our okay. patients and they are coming back to us, but we just follow up. Okay, okay. So they come back, though. They, yeah, they sure. come back. So, some of them die, of course. That's uh, good news. <laughs> <laughs> but um, not many of them. Uh, no, but I mean, come this back. is. I mean, it's not only theoretical here. I mean, it's theoretical in, uh, I don't know, 95 percent of the world. So I mean, this sure. is this is reality. So we have to be. I mean, we'll talk in other disease. We'll talk about the real life, and what is happening in the luckier few. This is the next, even a further level of, uh, what can I say, advancement. Now, I just had two comments, to, not questions, but just two mm. comments. One is on the story of um, dosing IL-6 and deciding whether. Mm. I mean, the lesson that we've learned, I mean, we haven't started yet, we'll start very soon, Nader um, The lesson we've learned is that uh, CRS is a clinical definition, and you have to intervene as soon as possible. So waiting for a dosing, unless you have it in-house, would be, apart from it, could be due to other causes. But it's not realistic. You have to start immediately. Mm -hmm. It's clinical, so mm -hmm. that's one point. The second is interesting. I mean, uh, I think it was your last question. Yes, there were two answers where you put pos the possibility of repeating CAR T, mm -hmm. the same or different. That's mm -hmm. not the point. This goes again into the issue of practicality. So you have an academic CAR T, the cost of lower. But I mean, I know of a patient in the States where he got his first CAR T and he spent whatever that is, 500,000. But the 500,000 is only for the infusion. Hmm. It's not for all the rest. Hmm. So, I mean, 500 is just a little part of that. If you end, a, you end up in the ICU or whatever, that's all additional cost. And the, and the response was good, but not good enough. So they offered a second infusion. And the patient just simply said, I can't. I can't afford. I can't pay. Obvious. So yeah. these are the tragic issues of this. Hmm. So just imagine a patient and a family. The response was good, but not perfect, and simply saying it's impossible. Fit technically, not who's going to pay for hmm. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are practical issues that hmm. I think we have to keep in mind. Yeah, thank you. No, for uh, uh, so very, uh, very important uh, comments. So thank you. And uh, you are right, for instance, uh, we have heard about the uh, patient that did not respond to one commercial car and was proposed to the second commercial card. Uh, so, but both have the same monoclonal antibody, FMC63. So it's no sense because the immune rejection is against precisely the part, the, the, the binding region of the monoclonal antibody are, are identical. So, and the second point is that in Spain at least, uh, the, 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 the regulatory agency uh, have, uh, has agreed with the companies to pay one year and a half after CART administration. If the patient is in complete remission, uh, will be, survival will be paid. And also for acute lymphoplastic leukemia, because in acute lymphoplastic leukemia, is if the patient uh, achieve, uh, achieves a complete remission, well, 90% achieves a complete remission, but relapse. So it's one year and a half, the patient must be in, in, in alive yeah, for pain. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, please, 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 please comment. A brief question regarding CRS. We have just started with CAR T in our institution, and just we have treated one patient. But uh, um, you mentioned that, uh, and in our, uh, we have treated a patient in a st clinical study in which we have a very strict rules regarding the use of, of steroids for CRS, and we have to postpone this, uh, the use of steroids after tocilizumab. If you look at the data presented at TASH uh, in the clinical practice by American colleagues, I think the most a more liberal uh, use of steroids, uh, and as you mentioned, you say that it's a difference between uh, dexamethasone and methylprednisolone, so you, may, you can use methylprednisolone uh, without any restriction, uh, without the fear to, uh, de to decrease the effect of CAR T cell, or also, yeah. it's also true for dexamethasone, that is a standard drug for yeah. CRS. 
Yeah, so, so uh, with respect to methylprednisone or dexamethasone, is we use dexamethasone if uh, there is a concomitant uh, neurological toxicity because it passes uh, better, not the, 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 the CNS barrier. Uh, but we try not to administer uh, steroids. Uh, is an, I think it's a standard now, is tocilizumab first line. This is a standard. After that, I think that there is no, there is no standard. Uh, so we try two doses of tocilizumab, and if not, corticosteroids. Or the patient is in grade four. If it is in grade four, we start uh, steroids. But in grade three, uh, while the patient is in grade three, is tocilizumab first dose, if not, uh, second dose. We administer the second dose 24 hours after the first one. There are groups that are administering if, uh, after eight hours tocilizumab. But it's like Graves vs. Host disease. It's uh, difficult to. So we must learn how to manage and how even to prevent uh, the, the, the cytokine release syndrome. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I uh, just had a question. Do you have any experience in refractory primary CNS lymphoma uh, with CAR T cells? No. 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 Uh, and I think that in most of the clinical trials are exclusion criteria. Uh, so we know that CARs pass very well the blood, the, 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 uh, the central nervous system barrier. They pass very well, and they are very active against disease in the in the meninges, for instance. No, for for uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, we have seen extremely good results. Even a meningitis, a, 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 a patient that uh, at the moment of administering the car, uh, the patient had in the in the lumbar pe a puncture a relapse in CNS, and the patient develops. Uh, uh, developed uh, uh, meningitis mm -hmm. due to the and with uh, many many cars in the in the liquid, but the the problem is the flare. I mean, if you administer car in a non in a with a mass in the in the central nervous system, we have seen in leg lymphoma uh, uh, to increase the mass of the lymphoma due to inflammatory response. That in the in the in, the, in a closed system, it would be of 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 uh, high risk. So. And for, for sure that it, it will respond the patient. But the, the, the risk of having a flare uh, and uh, compromise the, 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 the situation is, is high. And I think it's now is in most of the cases exclusion criteria, unfortunately. Thank you. And sorry, the second question uh, with regards to your case with double hit lymphoma, given how dismal the outcomes are, uh, even with aggressive chemotherapy, should, do you think we should be moving CAR T cells to more upfront um, mm. therapy? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, um, there are no many cases, uh, or uh, there are no uh, large series of cases uh, to analyze specifically double or triple heat, but for in small cases, it seems that there is no influence. It's because here is different. Here is the, 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 the drug is against CD19. It's the important point in the cell to express or not express CD19. What it happens in the, in the genetic situation of the cell, maybe it will influence with respect to the conventional drugs, response or, re, or be refractory to these drugs. But for the car, it, uh, they are agnostic. They are, if I see CD19, I will attack. So it seems that is, there is no influence for double, double or triple hit. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we'll continue. With, an, with yes, a, okay. another car, is that a month case? So, uh, this is the second case. Uh, I think that this is more for discussing what to do uh, for with a patient along the, the, the evolution. So, this is a, 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 a young male, 19 years old. Uh, the patient received uh, induction uh, chemotherapy with a high-risk protocol. He achieved a complete remission, minimal residual disease negative, uh, but not after the, the end of the treatment, the patient relapsed. So the patient uh, tried to be rescued with a flag uh, idarubicin. The patient achieved a complete remission, a minimal residual disease negative. So the patient in this situation, in complete remission, he went to a myeloablative, much related allogenic stem cell transplantation. Very good. Unfortunately, the patient relapsed uh, five months after the allogenic stem cell transplantation. 
20,000 20, uh, blasts uh, per, uh, per, uh, per millimeter uh, in peripheral blood, and the blast express CD19 as, the, 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 as all of them. Okay, so relapse after allogenic stem cell transplantation in an ALL case. So this is the the the, the presence of uh, uh, this is the blast. So this is the the the, the CD22 expression of the blast. This is CD19 expression of the blast. So what can we do with uh, a young patient uh, relapsing uh, ALL? after an allogenic stem cell transplantation and not reduce intensity conditioning regimen, a myeloablative conditioning regimen. And here is you must choose one, because I know that uh, there are several combinations, but you must choose just one. Is just to, as we do always in a relapse after allogenic stem cell transplantation, just stop immunosuppression. Two is donor lymphocyte infusion, Third is inotuzumab uh, 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 and as a bridge for allogenic stem cell transplantation, oblinatumumab as a bridge for allogenic stem cell transplantation, or in this moment, in this situation, CAR T cells. So what would you do uh, for this young person? Okay. Okay. So uh, number two and four, uh, yeah, is uh, is very reasonable. Uh, if we if we have no car, I think that number two plus two, number one plus two would be the logical step. Is what we are we have done for for many years. But unfortunately, the probability of a complete remission in ALL uh, with donor lymphocyte infusion is very is very low. And it has been studied, the, the, to, the comparison of a cohort of patients that receive donor lymphocyte infusion and the same group now doing CARTs are much better results with CAR than with donor lymphocyte infusion. Mm -hmm. Number uh, four, uh, again, that would be the option uh, if we don't have CAR. Uh, yes, although there are mm, many blasts in peripheral blood and, and in bone marrow, so blinatumumab, but uh, inotuzumab would be maybe more effective, but at the same time, more higher probability of venoclusive disease after, after a second allogenic stem cell transplantation. So blinatumumab maybe is good in terms of toxicity and efficacy in this case, but a second allogenic stem cell transplantation is, is a very risky uh, procedure in a patient that has relapsed soon after the first allogenic transplant. So we tried. CAR uh, cells, and if not, if it if doesn't work, we would proceed with a, a second allogenic stem cell transplantation is what we planned. It fails, second allogenic stem cell transplantation, because CAR, as I mentioned, the, the, there are no long-term complications. Okay, so the patient uh, uh, was transferred to our hospital, and this case was treated in another hospital, so he came to, to our hospital. Uh, he was in relatively good shape uh, with uh, active disease in peripheral blood. Uh, bone marrow, 90% of the cells were blasts. And so we had decided to do a CAR preparation. And so we have in peripheral, we must uh, collect T cells from, from the patient and from peripheral blood. And the peripheral blood contain uh, contains a lot of blast, 30,000 per millimeter times to the three, and there are these T cells in peripheral blood. Okay, so now is to think what, in, in, in a practice situation, what must do first, second and third? So we have decided CAR, okay, but the patient is with active disease, we must collect T cells, uh, are we administering uh, a, a bridge therapy or straight to the car? So there are different possibilities. One is to have the peripheral blood mononuclear cells uh, uh, to prepare the car and to administer the car. 
Second is, okay, is just to do a cytoreductive uh, 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 treatment, uh, more or less intensive. It is known that it's better to do low intensity treatment to avoid to uh, decrease the, 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 the score of the patient. So treatment and then peripheral blood mononuclear cell harvest or first peripheral blood mononuclear cell harvest to prepare the, the cars. And once we have the car, uh, lymphodepletion regimen uh, and the car. Four is in this patient because the family is uh, very nervous what uh, w we are planning to do with this patient. We are also very nervous about what is first uh, because there are no guidelines for, for doing this. So maybe is for the four uh, is a possibility, peripheral blood harvest, cytoreductive uh, reductive treatment, and just while the, the cars are being prepared, uh, just to administer the cyclophosphamide and fludarabine, and after that, the car administration, or just to say, uh, we are very sorry, but in this situation, we can't uh, include the patient in the car program. Okay, so we had uh, days to, to discuss this. You have 10 seconds, so. <laughs> Can we be rain? Okay. Okay, very good. Is what we did. Is uh, first is the, the to obtain the T cells because depending of the treatment that you are doing, you may lose these T cells. So first is to be sure that you obtain T cells from the patient despite the fact that their, these T-cells will be contaminated uh, by a lot of, 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 of blasts because we are introducing this inoculum or this, composi this cell composition, we are introducing in a device that will select with immunomagnetic beads the T-cells and the blast will not be introduced in the device. So uh, you may obtain easily T-cells without the blasts to start the procedure of CAR. And during the CAR preparation, you may administer the patient a cytoreductive uh, treatment. The reason is because bulky disease in ALL is not good business for, for, for CAR, in, not in the sense of, of response, but in the probability of cytokine release syndrome. So we have learned that it's much better to treat ALL patients, especially adult patients, with very low a bulky with very low activity. With high activity, the patient will respond, but the CRS will be uh, frequent and severe. And for adult patients, this is not good. Okay, so this is what we did. Okay, so peripheral blood mononuclear cells were collected and introduced in, in the prodigy, and the patient, while the cars were pre being prepared in the, in the device, uh, we administered just yes, uh, not intensive treatment, this is also clear, that for ALL patients, bridge therapy shouldn't be very inten uh, intense before car administration because the, the clinical situation of the patient deteriorates very rapidly. So it's just, it's just better trying to control and to reduce the disease with a, let's say, mild uh, chemotherapy. With this treatment, uh, the patient uh, 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 achieved uh, 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 neutropenia and thrombocytopenia and a temporary response is what I mentioned before. We had patients treated in complete remission, but with prednisone and cyclophosphamide, so very temporary. The, the, prognosis, the, the expectancy is that for a complete remission for a very uh, short period of time. So we administered the, the ones we had uh, the cars, we administered just yes, 1 million cars per kilogram with cyclophosphamide and fludarabine. This is the, the standard now in the world for, for, uh, for, car, for car administration is cyclophosphamide. Is, here is uh, 900 milligrams a square meter and fludarabine is 90 milligrams a square meter in three different doses, so 330, 330, 330. And okay, so. Uh, we administered the, the car, and three days later, the patient uh, febrile, uh, the, the, the CRP rise, 
and the, also the ferritin, and with a generalized skin rash. And uh, we monitor the, the, the CAR in peripheral blood, so we see the number of T-cells and what is the proportion of T-cells having this murine molecule, so how many of them are uh, CARs. In this case, 30%, 30% of all T-cells in peripheral blood were CARs. So there, there was a nice expansion of CARs in this, in this patient, but developed uh, fever and a generalized skin rash. Uh, we thought mm, uh, maybe it's uh, maybe is a uh, grave versus host disease because although, well, it's a, maybe it's a grave versus host disease because the patient uh, had received a myeloablative uh, re match-related uh, transplant. So maybe this T cells expansion uh, is a grave versus host disease. Uh, this is the histology of the biopsy. There, wo there were no gastrointestinal symptoms or liver inflammation. This is the, the image of the skin. Okay, so, and again, uh, we were uh, not, we had no, a lot of experience about uh, what to do in, this, in these cases and what was the, the, this complication. So what is the cause of the, the etiology of the uh, skin rash and how should it be treated? First is, it is Graves versus host disease. We should administer uh, steroids. Second is, well, this is due to a CAR T cell expansion. We should start tocilizumab or we should start uh, systemic steroids because uh, the patient is, uh, may develop a severe Graves versus host disease or just, uh, this is due to the CAR T cell expansion, but just try topical steroids, or maybe it's uh, great for uh, uh, thrombocytopenia. This is related to thrombo thrombocytopenia. Okay, so what do you think in this situation from a rational point of view? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it is due to the well. We uh, due to the histology, uh, it seemed not to be associated with Graves versus host disease. What was our first hypothesis? Uh, so we considered that was just as uh, observed in immune cell mediated uh, therapies, just associated with the immune cells. No, so just to be due to the CAR T cell expansion. Tocilizumab is uh, not the case because uh, tocilizumab is administered uh, when the patient is, uh, has a hypotension requiring vasopressors or is uh, with hypoxia requiring high flow. These are the two requisites, one of two or both, to administer tocilizumab. So it's a grade three, grade three uh, cytokine release syndrome. So, uh, vasopressors or high flow oxygen for uh, administering tocilizumab. If not, it's just to observe the patient because it's what we want is uh, to have a high expansion of CARs is good. If this high CAR expansion uh, as a consequence uh, has this grade three CRS, we will treat with tocilizumab. If not, just to see, okay? So here we consider that was just an expansion of the CAR T cells, the, the reason for the skin rash. So we administer topical steroids. So topical steroids, steroids were initiated and the skin rash improved rapidly. And, but again, sorry, but uh, this is a complication that the patient developed just before administering cyclophosphamide and, and, and fludarabine that was uh, uh, worse, worsening after the fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, which is neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. So at day 30 after CAR administration, after 30 days of CAR administration, the patient had a grade four neutropenia and thrombocytopenia, and the bone marrow biopsy was compatible with aplastic anemia. So 
we had the, we had that complication of the first days after the car administration solved, no problem. The patient was in very good shape, but with an apparently anaplastic anemia. Okay, so in this situation is uh, so the bone marrow biopsy empty, uh, the neutropenia and thrombocytopenia 30 days after car administration. So these are different possibilities to do in this case. First is a salvage, allogenic stem cell transplantation. Second, so other possibility is just to uh, CD34 positive selection. Uh, so to have a pure uh, uh, composition of, of CD34 cells and just to boost the patient with these CD34 cells to recover uh, this uh, aplasia. Third is a thrombopack as a stimulus of the hemopoietic progenitor cell progeny and consider that gamma interferon may influence this aplasia. Four is GCSF and transfusion support and weight. Five is transfusion support, not GCSF, because GCSF may stimulate the T cells and create a cytokine release syndrome. So what of these possibilities uh, would you vote? Okay, mm -mm -mm. okay, good. So uh, we will start with the, with the number five because it's the uh, one third of the of uh, all the audience uh, uh, chose. Uh, no GCSF. We don't administer GCSF uh, while the patient is uh, in uh, at risk of, of CRS. So, because as GCSF, you know that is a trigger of autoimmune diseases. Uh, so, uh, while the, uh, and, and, and of capillary, capillary leak syndrome. So, uh, during the first two weeks, we don't administer GCSF, and especially if the patient has a cytokine release syndrome. If not. Uh, GCSF is a very good uh, treatment for neutropenia uh, uh, after car administration. So the message of this uh, of this uh, um, of this slide is that it is not only cytokine release syndrome an important complication of car, but also pancytopenia. So we have seen patients with two three months of severe pancytopenia due to the car administration, and in some cases we have administer boost of donor CD34 cells. And in another case, we have performed an aploidentical stem cell transplantation, a second allogenic stem cell transplantation, uh, but was due to the myelodysplastic uh, features. So this is a real problem, uh, uh, the pancytopenia after CART administration, and it is due to the cyclophosphamide, fludarabine, in a, uh, to a hemopoiesis that has received uh, different uh, lines of chemotherapy, and also due to the cytokines, uh, especially gamma interferon. So this case was at day 30. So our plan was was number four. This is this was our plan. And in the case that uh, the, the pancytopenia uh, was uh, persistent for two, three months, is number three, number two, or even number one. This is the plan, uh, is what we planned. So uh, the, the response to GCSF was good. Uh, so more than 1.5, uh, more than 1,500 uh, granulocytes uh, per, uh, per microliter. And although the patient received a platelet transfusion every five days, no need of red, uh, red cell transfusion. So, but this is an important complication after car administration, pancytopenia, and it persistent, and so persistent sometimes two, three months. So, Four months, four months after CAR administration, again, no CAR T cell detection and B cell recovery. We look at bone marrow aspirate. The bone marrow aspirate was in complete remission, minimal residual disease negative by both flow cytometry and next generation uh, sequencing. So the CAR disappeared, but was in, in, in remission. Six months, Extensive Graves-Sous-Haut disease, in this case, very clear, 
was treated with systemic steroids and photophoresis. The problem here is that the car has disappeared, although the patient is in complete remission. So this is the, the, the elimination of, uh, of blasts, um, before in blue, after the, the, the car. So 12 months after, so we uh, waited, and two months, uh, one year after the car administration, the bone marrow aspirate again uh, demonstrated a complete remission, minimal residual disease negative, but 16 months, one year, four months later of car administration, bilateral tibial pain, and with a, with a PET positive, I will show you the, the this is the, 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 in the, in very close to the knee, and this focus of, of, uh, with, of activity. Uh, so we had uh, a, a sample of, um, there were blasts, uh, CD19 positive and CD22 uh, uh, positive. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so what to do in, in, what should we do in this case is a relapse after car administration, uh, local car, local uh, 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 relapse, so it's just, okay, we did what we can, so it's just palliative treatment, or is to administer uh, a, a second dose of car or a different car due to the reason I mentioned about the, 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 the immune rejection of the car. This, the car was lost four months after the administration. Four is administered blinatumumab plus allogenic stem cell transplantation or inotuzumab plus allogenic stem cell transplantation. I think this is the last slide, or so I think that okay. is just last effort. Mm-hmm. Okay. Number three uh, is right. Is right. The problem is that we don't have, uh, 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 we didn't have at that moment the possibility of administering uh, uh, a different car, uh, Kim Raya, for instance. That would be a very good uh, possibility because the, the cells expressed CD19. So we didn't administer our own car second time because is what I mentioned that uh, is uh, uh, knownless, is, is just, it would be lost in, 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 in 15 days. If we had the possibility of, of administering uh, uh, Kim Raya, maybe that would be a good, a good possibility. We didn't have that possibility. So uh, the, the, what we did is the second choice is uh, blinatumumab and allogenic stem cell transplantation. So we have started treatment with blinatumumab, good clinical response, and uh, we will uh, uh, perform a second allogenic stem cell transplantation from a different, from a different donor. So, spasiva. <laughs> so, Professor Alvaro, thank you very much for very interesting uh, information in your presentation, very interesting uh, clinical situation. And uh, it seems for me that we discussed the future uh, treatment option. So for, because uh, for the most of uh, hematologists in a different area of the world, this uh, option is not so uh, available. Yeah, yes, now, not yet. But uh, <laughs> I, I think that you agree with me so how many dreamers are in uh, our audience, <laughs> it's seen in these uh, answers. So thank you. And just one question, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, when you collect T cells after allo, after the first allo, these T cells were from donor or from the patient, okay. because there was a huge burden of uh, tumor cells, but T cells were from donor of from the patient. So the chimerism. Okay, yeah, thank you. So this is a very good question, is uh, should we choose uh, T cells from the donor or from the patient, although the, chim the, the chimerism status was 100% of the donor? We would have preferred to 
obtain the T cells from the veins of the donor because these T cells are fresh. These T cells have not been in contact with any immunosuppression or with any treatment. So that uh, these T cells probably uh, uh, would be much more potent. But we can't because it is an uh, autologous clinical trial and the regulatory agency said no, you can't use uh, cells from the donor because you have specified in your uh, clinical trial that is autologous CAR. Although genetically it's allogenic, the T cell, we, we can, but other groups have done this, uh, that is have used the, the T cells from the donor. But at the time of relapse, uh, what um, percentage of uh, donor uh, hematopoiesis was? What was the chimera? Okay, we, we performed the, 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 the chimera in myeloid cells and in uh, uh, T cells. Yeah. So T cells, uh, specifically with, with Automax. So T cells, 100% of the donor. Okay. Yes. And, and, and the quantity of blasts, uh, it doesn't matter because we select the T cells with the immunomagnetic beads. So T cells were from the donor? From the donor, for sure, 100%. Okay, thank you. Коллеги, у кого-то есть еще комментарии или нет? Мы немножко вышли из брачка, так что, в общем, мы должны за заканчивать, поэтому спасибо.